Hey, my name's Adam. Welcome to my Rare Classic Car Channel. Today, an exciting treat for the Chevrolet fans. This 1970 Chevrolet Caprice. Something that you don't see really anymore in any form, but especially not with a 454 big block under the hood. We'll talk a little bit more about the details and discuss and take a drive. Stay tuned. So this Caprice is a very unique vehicle, in part because it was ordered with a big block, but for a number of other reasons. This vehicle, this very vehicle, was actually built in the saint Therese plant in Quebec. So pour les Québécois, salut, bonjour. Um, and for the others, hello and welcome. In any event, this was built in the saint Therese plant in Quebec, in Canada, and it was ordered by an individual who lived in Quebec who uh, actually ordered it kind of to use as a funeral flower car. And you can kind of see that in the, you know, the black paint, although it does have a blue interior. I don't know why he wanted a 454 powered car to haul flowers around for funerals because funerals clearly are very high speed, but he did. And he ordered a 454 powered car with the F40 heavy duty suspension, road wheels, the fender skirts, and a few other things, AM, FM radio, tilt wheel, no air conditioning though. And remember, this was a car from, from Canada, so uh, Canadian vehicles often didn't have air conditioning in this period, no matter what they were. And the car was in his possession for a couple decades before it was bought by the individual that I bought it from. And people often ask, how do I find my cars? Well, I'll tell you, this beautiful low mileage rare gem was on an auction site. Um, no, not really. In fact, it was on Facebook Marketplace. So Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. I don't go to auctions. I don't go to dealer websites. I just try to find these vehicles in either generally Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. And that's where this one popped up. Now I will say when you see something like this pop up on one of those sites, you need to act quickly. So it was in Oshawa, Ontario. I saw it and I thought, you know, the one thing that I don't own, I own a lot of big block powered cars. I've never ever owned a big block powered Chevrolet. I own plenty of small block Chevrolets. I've never had a big block Chevrolet. And for those of you who are fans of this channel, you know that I love the big luxury cars and it just was not a popular uh, option in that period. So as soon as I saw it, I called the owner and I came to look at it the next day and I bought it the day after and trailered it home. So you have to move fast if you see something like this that's rare. And this is a super rare car. It came with all of the GM Canada documentation uh, with it. And it's one of about 50, five zero uh, Caprices that were sold in Canada with a 454 engine. That's it. So it was a very rare car. I have no idea what the production figures in the United States were for 454, 454 power Caprices, but they were extremely rare. So that was how I got this car. I bought it and then I trailered it home. I'll show a few videos of the day that I bought it. I'll post that so you can see and a little bit of the history going into Canada, crossing the border, having a bit of fun. I haven't been over into uh, Canada ever since the travel ban, so it was really the first time I had been there, but didn't experience any issues aside from a somewhat grumpy border agent, which I guess they kind of always are. In any event, pick up this vehicle, and now let's talk a little bit more about the Caprice itself. So the Caprice was introduced in the 1965 model year as a trim package on the Impala and the mission of the Caprice was really to push Chevrolet up market using this trim package and the designers really didn't get much money. The main differentiator for the Caprice, almost everything aside from some badging and a few little doodads, was the interior. This beautiful kind of biscuit pleated interior with button tufting and I believe the charge here was for the designers to take hundred dollars ish of cost and see what they could do to jazz up the Impala. 
So that task fell to a gentleman by the name of Blaine Jenkins, a GM interior designer at the time. And Mr. Jenkins is famous for doing a number of interiors on General Motors vehicles over the years. So he's responsible for this Caprice. And if you look at that seating pattern that I was just showing, I can almost say that anything of this era that has button tufting on a GM car probably had some influence from him. So if you have or seen, I'll put pictures, little uh, pictures off to the side, but uh, the 1972 Oldsmobile 98 Regency interior, that was a Blaine Jenkins interior. The 1967 Tornado interior and its improvements versus the admittedly plain Jane 1966 Tornado interior. That was a Blaine Jenkins creation as well. The early 90s Corvette interior, that was his, although there's no button tufting. And Mr. Jenkins was also responsible for coming up with a beautiful exterior color, kind of a silvery lavender color called Evening Orchid. And you can find pictures of that, those vehicles, and that color is, is just spectacular on these 60s era, 70s. Actually, I think it stopped being used in General Motors cars in the 60s, didn't continue into the 70s. So Mr. Jenkins had a long, illustrious career of putting button tufting on many things, even some of the Corvairs, I believe. But this was his creation, and the, he was so successful with the Caprice that when he went to Oldsmobile Studio, they gave him a similar charge with the Regency, I think what could you do with a couple hundred dollars of incremental cost at the time? And he came up with that loose cushion, button tufted, overstuffed, middle class version of luxury, if you will, that frankly I think is pretty spectacular. But the Caprice, as I said, was introduced in 1965. It continued until 1996, was revived again by General Motors in 2011 to 2017, I believe, as a rear wheel drive Chevrolet, similar to the Pontiac G8 for fleets and uh, as well as police vehicles. But in general, 65 to 96 was the lifetime of this car. And in 1970, Chevrolet sold 92,000 Caprices in the US across two body styles, this hard top sedan and the coupe. I actually have always been a fan of the sedans of the Chevrolets of this period, the hard tops, because the coupes have kind of this funky, yeah, very formal roof line and curved back glass. To me, it just doesn't look quite right. This has a much sleeker sloped roof line. To me, looks much better proportioned. I love the back end. And Chevrolet had this three tail light theme for a number of years into the 80s, even on the A cars like the Celebrity, the Caprices still had that. Even the Lumina, the W car, had the three tail light theme, which I didn't even know was a Chevrolet thing for a while until I noticed it and was reading some articles on it. And it was. Kind of like now, one of the Chevy trademarks is five spoke wheels, which coincidentally, there's a Chevrolet Trailblazer over there. The white vehicle you can see has five spoke wheels. I had no idea that that was a brand characteristic for Chevrolet until I read that. I guess they failed to tell competitors that they can't use five spoke wheels. But on the Chevrolet, that three taillight theme was, was a brand characteristic. And the front end on this after the 68, 69 Caprice is a little bit tepid. No hidden headlight option here. But I think it's still handsome. It kind of has that 1964 Cadillac style to it as well. This bumper is one piece. And I would say this car has some kind of ingenious cost savings ideas that maybe are well executed or maybe not. One thing that's interesting to me is just these fish gills, if you will, and how they're integrated into this lower valence panel. This is actually a valence panel. You can see it's separate from the bumper. But this is kind of crudely bent metal. And if you look at different angles, it's not perfectly formed. It's kind of wavy. And that's just the way that it was done back in the day. So it's not an inset piece. It's just this hole is punched out of the valence and then it's wrapped over. One problem with this vehicle, it's always attracting attention. A passerby 
wanted to talk about it, so I'm back. In any event, this metal is kind of crudely formed here on both sides. And there was no split bench option in the Caprice. It did give you, they did give you the armrest, but you couldn't get a split bench, which you could get in the higher end trims of other vehicles. But the Caprice was priced at $3,905 in 1970, which was $5 more. This is, that's the hardtop sedan price. That was $5 more than the Pontiac Bonneville hardtop sedan. And it was about midway between the LeSabre and Electra and Delta 88, 98 pricing. So just to give you a sense of where this slotted in the overall lineup. And the Ford LTD Brome, the top of the line Ford at the time, was priced at about $3,600. So this was considerably more expensive than the top of the line Ford, $5 more than the Bonneville, and really priced in between the 8898 LeSabre Electra lineup. So quite an expensive car for Chevrolet. And again, they were trying to push the Caprice up market, and I think they did it fantastically. The one thing about the Chevrolet is that it does have a shorter wheelbase. This is only, only 119 inch wheelbase. And as you went to the other divisions, you would get bigger wheelbases on some of the more premium vehicles. This car does have, as I mentioned, the road wheels, which is a bit of a misnomer. For those who have never had a car with these quote unquote road wheels, it's a trim ring and a hubcap. <laughs> That's, it's not a wheel per se. This is not, this is not one piece. It's kind of humorous. Like I said, you can see this is separate from the wheel. This is a hubcap and this is a trim ring. So you pry this little trim ring off and you pry the hubcap off, which I think is just humorous. It looks great. I mean, ingenious cost savings. And as a finance guy, which is what I do for a living, you have to appreciate the ways in which GM squeezed out a few pennies on these things. Although that was probably more than a few pennies. But the the value that you got for this car is just tremendous. Beautiful styling and then particularly on the inside and in blue this rich rich interior is just stunning. The blue has great saturation, wonderful quality, this nylon, some people call it panty cloth, but very durable, soft, seats are extremely comfortable. really plush headrests. They were also shared with other GM divisions. You can see the rear window defogger, not the defroster. That's a defogger, not heated, just a blower type motor that shoots air on the rear window to defog it. And turning inside, I mean, look at these door panels. Beautiful pleating here, hand stitching. And even though this is fake wood, this is still expensive by the period to do all of these little pieces of wood trim on the door panels, the steering wheel, the instrument panel. <laughs> the instrument panel and the steering wheel look really fake, but it does set it off nicely, I have to say. This car, as I mentioned, doesn't have air conditioning, but one nice feature that Chevrolet did that the other divisions didn't is it still has these upper vent registers and it has the lower kickwall registers. So you have two pull handles here that activate either this vent or the bottom vent. Same on the other side, you have a vent here. So you do get some ventilation at your face and this car does have tinted glass. So it's a bit less hot in the summer. And it has this super funky airflow control, which is very poorly ergonomically uh, designed here. I mean, you kind of have to reach around the steering wheel and activate this. This top lever controls an air door, the outside air door. And if you keep moving it, it closes the outside air door and then it activates the fan. And it's got the multi-speed fan here. So turn the key on. You can hear the fan. That's high speed. Medium, low, off. 
So strange control there. That turns the fan on, and then you have the temperature slider. And then if you want the defroster, you slide this over, depending on if you want it on part way or all the way, and it directs air out of the upper registers. This is all cable controlled, no vacuum doors. So I think that's one of the reasons why they did that. They didn't have any cost for the automatic vacuum doors with the other type of climate control that had the two slider bars where there was cold, hot, and then you'd have another slider for the vent, heat, defrost, you know, etc. That often had vacuum diaphragms to move the airflow. This is just all cable operated and you, the driver, are doing it yourself, which is not an offensive system. I would say what is a bit offensive is the ergonomics here. Uh, just trying to push, imagine you're going down a bumpy road and you're trying to turn the fan speed up this is kind of clunky. I would much prefer a vertical lever here to activate the fan. Gauge cluster is quite you know, nice, and I guess they're coming for me uh, in the background noise there. But the gauge cluster is quite nice. Ga the gauges are readily readable. Turn signals are a little funky, but typical for the period. No gauges aside from the fuel gauge, all idiot lights. Generator and the oil lighter on because the key is on. Car does have the tilt wheel, as I mentioned. On the dash, this is all soft touch, but this is metal. And the glove box door is metal. So it feels quite substantial. Not a big glove box. There's a sunshade in here. This door is really heavy. Nice perforated vinyl headliner. This car does have kick well lights when you open the doors. It does have one dome light, no lights in the C pillars. So a bit of cost savings versus the Olds and Buick and even uh, the Pontiac there. But in spite of the little things where they tried to save money, you have a tremendous feeling, as I said, of value in this vehicle. I don't feel like they cheaped out really anywhere or that I was gypped. In fact, sitting behind the wheel here, it feels quite rich. And the previous owner put this humorous sticker on here, use overdrive during high speed pursuit. I don't know where he got that. This car doesn't have overdrive. It's just a three speed turbo hydromatic 400 transmission. All right, let's see the business end of this car and pop the hood. So what lies beneath with the 454? There it is. And the air cleaner cover is a little crooked here. So I'm going to adjust that because that bugs me. But an all original 454 LS4 motor. So in this vehicle, you could get a 250 horsepower 350 cubic inch motor, a 300 horsepower 350 cubic inch motor, a 400 cubic inch V8 that I believe was 265 horsepower, it was a two barrel, this 454 at 345 horsepower, and then there was a top dog 454 390 horsepower. So this is one down from the top. I've actually never seen a Caprice with the 454 390 horsepower engine. It was rare just to have one with a 454. But this is all original. Valve covers haven't been painted. You can see it's got the sticker that says the Tonawanda team there on the valve cover. It does have power steering, power brakes. But look at how clean this car is. You know, just the fender aprons, control arm bushings, the upper control arms, etc. Always loved and cared for. Interestingly, the previous owner had converted the ignition to electronic ignition, which I don't do. I actually prefer points and condenser because if you start having issues, the car will run bad as opposed to just die on you. But he converted it. I can always convert it back. And he did do that, but the car still had the original distributor cap and rotor, which after all these years, the cap was pretty corroded so the car didn't run all that well and was didn't have full power the other thing that was interesting was 
The accelerator pedals on some of these older cars are adjustable. The height is adjustable. So this rod that goes to the carburetor has is threaded and you can spin it and it'll adjust the accelerator pedal height and also in essence how much the throttle plate will open on the carburetor. Well the throttle return spring on here was relatively weak and somebody had adjusted this rod so that the accelerator pedal was quite low and it didn't have the full pedal travel. This is something that I'm noticing as I buy some of these low mileage vehicles. It was the same story on my 65 Pontiac Catalina. Then what happens is you don't have the full opening of the throttle, the full travel, and the kickdown switch also cannot get activated because the kickdown switch is activated as this, I'll show here, I'll take the air cleaner off, as this uh, throttle opens. So if the throttle doesn't open all the way, no transmission kick down. Let me take this air cleaner thing off here. So here is the throttle return spring and I put a new one on. This is the kick down switch which gets activated as the throttle opens. You can see it comes into contact with it. And if you have the accelerator pedal height misadjusted, you don't have the throttle blades open and the kick down switch doesn't get touched by that. And that was the case. So when I got the car, I thought it was fast to begin with, but <laughs> wow, after a new cap and a rotor and adjusting the accelerator pedal height, it only had about 80% of the pedal travel. So again, this is something that I find is, is true on some of the vehicles that I buy because I think the throttle return spring starts to get weak after a number of years and then people complain that the car idles high because the throttle doesn't return all the way to close throttle and then what the mechanics do is just adjust the accelerator pedal height to get rid of the issue but you don't have you don't have the full pedal travel or throttle opening anymore so a little tip for you if you're buying a classic vehicle like this you put the heat stove pipe back on here and the PCV breather tube. So this is the business end of the Caprice and an impressive business end it is. All these General Motors big block engines are impressive but I have to say this motor and this car, this is a light car by the era, about 38, 3900 pounds. Again the wheelbase is smaller than the other divisions vehicles and this car this is probably the I think this is the fastest car I own of all the luxury sedans it moves it moves with authority so and it's quiet it's very smooth it's completely inoffensive and docile if you just drive it around town normally and then if you step on it it moves very very quickly yeah I'll start it up Everybody loves it when I reach in and do the start, so we'll try it. And the motor's a little cold, so the fast idle's on. Nice and smooth. And boy does it sound great coming out of these dual exhausts here. It's getting windy today. Let's take a look at the trunk. Pretty big trunk here with the original double stripe spare. Lots of room, about 19 cubic feet. The multiple body trunk. Maybe I'll just pause and show you how big it is.
Well, here we go. Big trunk. Seems like a lot of the uh, car aficionados love to sit in the trunk and open it for a more dramatic shot. So maybe I'll do that just to please some of the viewers here. And quite spacious, as you can see. I can fit myself, a couple friends, or lots of luggage. They just don't make trunks like this anymore, and this is why I think everybody gets an SUV now, aside from wanting to feel aggressive and in charge, um, because a lot of cars don't have a lot of space now. The roof lines are quite small, not much daylight opening in terms of the window glass area, and the trunks are pretty shrimpy. So in order to get something that's halfway usable, you have to get an SUV, which I just, that's not my style. This is much cooler. Plenty of room inside, plenty of room in the trunk. Big V8, quiet, smooth, a lot of fun. So now that we've looked at the car, talked about it a little bit, the engine and transmission and the trunk, let's take it for a ride. All right, let's take it for a drive and see how this Caprice performs. Gotta love that sound of a big block. I'll put the windows up here. And one of the things I love about the hardtops, there's no pillar, which makes for this very open and airy cabin that you just can't get today because of the rollover standards. And let me put the fan on here so I am not, I am not going to be overheating. All right, I think we're ready to go. So the first impression getting behind the wheel is, gosh, what a comfortable seat well-designed, great seating position. Steering wheel is, you know, good distance. I'm six foot one, I got plenty of leg room. Steering wheel is well positioned for me. And the other, the other first impression here is, what a smooth motor. Again, for a big block Chevrolet, you have this feeling of, gosh, it's gonna be loud and raucous and raw, and it's not at all. It's the exact antithesis of that, in fact. This motor is very smooth, extremely quiet. I'm a stickler for original style exhaust on my cars. I don't like to hear the rumble. Some of my cars do. You've seen the videos from my that I've had for a long time. Uh, when I liked a bit louder exhaust, you know, they have a little rumble. They're still quiet. They're not glass packs or anything like that. But I've aged, I guess, and now I just enjoy having overall quiet cars and it's it it allows you to have and replicate the experience that this car had new this car does have 45,000 miles on it but this is a uh, extremely well cared for 45,000 miles the owner that I bought it from bought it with about 20,000 miles on it he only drove it on nice days he was the guy who when I went to see it and uh, uh, there was a little bird dropping that fell on the hood he had a spritzer bottle in the trunk he popped the trunk got the spritzer bottle and was instantly wiping it off that's the kind of guy you want to buy a car from and he talked about how he had had the radiator record he didn't want to put a new one in he wanted to keep it original he had done a number of maintenance items so it was clear that he had babied this car and had loved it for quite some time again you know as you're searching out these cars that's not always going to be the case Often I find these low mileage cars are kind of neglected in the hands, you know, they've fallen into the hands of someone in the family who has inherited it, doesn't understand it, doesn't have the time to maintain it. And so that may not always be the case. And you should plan on putting some money. I would budget a thousand dollars kind of for any of these vehicles that you buy. If you don't do the work yourself to get it up to snuff, make sure that it runs well, it's going to be reliable. But this one, when I talked to the guy, and like I said, when I saw he had the spritzer bottle with the wax, he had a box just full of uh, terry cloth towels, that's the guy you want to buy a car from. And one of the things, the strategies that I use as I go and, and drive these vehicles, people often look at me and, and wonder why is a young guy you know, interested in a car like this? Well, first of all, I'm pushing 40 years old. So maybe I don't look it, but 
Um, I guess, you know, that's good genes that I have, thanks to my father and mother. But, um, you know, still relatively young. Why am I interested in this? They are skeptical. And the first thing I do to put them at ease, I want to see a test drive of the car. But I'll tell them, you can drive the car. I'll sit in the passenger seat. And that really puts them at ease. And, and to be honest, you can observe everything that you need to from the passenger seat. I can tell if the suspension's tight, if the wheel's crooked, the brakes are pulsing, if there's any unnatural noises, the motor doesn't run well, transmission shifts abruptly. I don't need to be in the driver's seat to observe that. Now, I will say one time I did that, and I was looking at a 66 Tornado, and the owner was pushing his late 80s, and he was the original owner of the car. And uh, <laughs> that was the scariest drive that I've been in the passenger seat because he said, okay, let's go for a ride. You know, he puts it in gear. We get to the main road. He pulls out in front of traffic and really <laughs> is feathering the accelerator pedal to the point where uh he was going maybe 20 miles an hour on a 50 mile an hour speed limit road and i told him after a couple blocks i'm done i'm good i'm done i thought we were going to get in a car wreck and i think that his family was making him sell the car he was very attached to it i ended up not buying that particular one but um maybe it was the experience left me too shell shocked in any event back to this car you know it, it's no driving this it's no surprise why people the love of the, the cars is just kind of uh, evaporated because even in a family sedan here the feeling of richness and airiness of the cabin and de attention to detail is just so much greater than when you get in a modern car it's always got a black or gray interior black or tan headliner plasticky door panels terrible quality seat cloth Everything's got leather, and it's such poor quality leather that it looks like vinyl. And modern cars don't really do anything exceedingly well that evokes emotional reactions unless you buy a very purposeful car like a Tesla Model S Plaid, right? I mean, you're buying that because you want to go 0 to 60 in, in under 2 seconds. But if you're just buying an everyday car, they don't do anything exceedingly well. They're kind of boring. They don't accelerate overly well. They don't handle all that well. They don't brake all that well. Yes, they do do those things better than this car. It, although I don't know on the acceleration front, some average family haulers that's not true for. But they tend to. Ha they obviously have better safety, and they do have a number of redeeming qualities. But there's no soul. You get in this car, and it kind of makes you feel like I don't know God. That's a, a hyperbolic expression, but it makes you feel. I don't know, good, fun to drive. Again, it, it's it's just the smoothness and the quietness, and I'm going down really frost even pavement here, so probably not a great demonstration of the smoothness, but it's, it's just a totally different experience that's unique, and I'm kind of sad that it's gone. I think the electric car is gonna bring some of that back uh, with the excitement and how quiet it is, but this is kind of a 1970s era electric car. I don't hear the motor hardly at all. Uh, the cabin is very quiet, and I'm super comfortable. You know, modern cars with the center consoles and everything, it just intrudes on the space. You can have a full-size car, and it feels like it's a compact because you have no leg room, no shoulder room. Here I can just spread out. I have tons of room and, you know, room for six. Not really any passengers' uh, cars today that have room for six or SUVs. It's pretty rare. Now, this car, I will say, it's interesting. By this time, the even in 1970, emission controls were starting to get put in place, albeit you know not anything compared to the later 70s. But cars like this in General Motors, even in 1970, they started having... Uh, switches so that if you were not at the transmission weren't in second or third gear there were there was no spark advance uh, the jetting was a bit lean so i've gone through and rejetted this carburetor and it's made all the difference it wasn't slow before but the part throttle acceleration wasn't that great and on these quadra jets if you just change the primary metering rods and make them two or three thousandths bigger i find that 
the cars just have so much more part throttle tip in and you know overall again a really enjoyable experience only thing i'll say for this 1970 generation is that as you drive over the frost even pavement it does feel like this car is made out of a solid billet of steel it's very solid chassis is very I would say that I, there's no discernible chassis flex in this car, which the next generation, the 71 to 76, has a lot of chassis flex. But it has some quirks in that these drip moldings extend all the way down the front of the car, and they create some wind rush and noise. I would say the cabin in this isn't as quiet as you know, the higher level cars, like the 70 Electra that I, that I have or others the caprice doesn't have quite as much sound editing but it's not offensive it does have a decent amount of wind noise that went away in the next generation as they got rid of some of these drip rails and things where the air would create vortices and, and uh, you know create some noise and of course this car does have the original door seals and everything so they are soft and pliable and they do appear to seal well and i can say that even just driving these low mileage cars the next generation is quieter inside I don't think the next generation really has much else redeeming about it over this generation. This generation of GM car from 65 to 70 is powerful, relatively quiet, great handling, great uh, chassis rigidity, and overall a very pleasant place to be and also a lot more powerful. 1971 is the first year of General Motors vehicles where the engine power is reduced because they all have low compression. They were forced to run, it was a General Motors edict on low octane, no lead gas. It took Ford and Chrysler another year for that to be true. So they started in 72 with that. But General Motors starting in 71, they all had to run on uh, low octane, no lead gas. So the motors, the compression ratio goes down. This is a 10.25 to 1 compression ratio motor and the next year went down to 8 to 1. So the power really dropped off a cliff. So 1970 in particular is a great year if you're going to buy a classic GM vehicle it's a great year for engines because it's the only year of the 454 where it's a high compression motor. It's the only year of the Buick 455 where it's high compression. It's uh, the 454 in high compression form only lasted one year and for Buick the 455 was only one year. The Olds 455 was around for a number of years starting in 68 I believe so it had a number of high compression years. The Cadillac 472 was around for a number of years in high compression form although the 500 cubic inch was introduced in 1970 only in the Eldorado and only for one year as high compression and was rated at 400 gross horsepower. So if you're looking for a really nice 70s car, the 1970 model year of General Motors vehicles is a great one, particularly for the big block engines and the ones that I just mentioned. The only downside is they started taking cost out of the interiors really in the late 60s by 1970. So some of the division's interiors, in particular Cadillac, start to look a little chintzy versus the mid-60s interiors. But Chevrolet, it's, it's no question looking at this interior why they had such a commanding lead in sales and why they were the number one brand in the US. This car screams value, screams high quality at a price point that was sub $4,000 at the time. And you know, I would say being a Ford lover and a Mopar lover, if I were test driving all these vehicles in the 1970 model year, this one would have been a great one. I might have, I might have sprung for something like this if I were around in 1971 in a family car, I probably would have got the top 454 um, just for fun. But this is kind of the car that I would have bought. The 70 LTD is a great car and I think a great styled car. Wonderful unique features with the hidden headlights. Quiet ride, very, very smooth. The Ford rides smoother than this. This is a pretty stiff ride by the Ares uh, comparison. Not as stiff as a Mopar, but stiffer than a Ford for sure. And, you know, the Ford does have, I would say, maybe a little bit better quality, but this powertrain would have won me over. The big block Chevrolet, the turbo hydromatic 400 transmission. C6s for Ford are really good transmissions, but they have a, a shift firmness 
that the GM Turbo Hydromatics and the Chrysler 727s, you know, torque flights, don't. Those transmissions are buttery smooth. The C6, you feel the shifts. And for me, if I'm driving a luxury car, I don't want to feel the motor, hear the motor, unless I really step into it. I don't want to feel the car shift. So I think GM, you know, was just, uh, was building some really nice stuff during this period. I would also say the steering gear in this car is infinitely better than what was in the Ford of the period. Ford, the steering ratio is so slow that you're just winding the wheel, you know, no matter where you're going almost. GM, this variable ratio steering box that, or steering gear, I should say, that turns the wheels faster with the more that you turn the wheel is the best of the period, in my in my opinion. Chrysler also had a pretty good steering gear, but I like the GM the best. So from the engine and transmission standpoint, the steering standpoint, the handling standpoint, GM just, I think, had a lot going in this period. Now, when you go to the next generation of cars, 71 to 76, you know, I would, sorry about that. I would, uh, I would admittedly go for the Ford in the next generation. I think they were higher quality and better built, et cetera. This generation, this, this particular 65 to 70 generation for GM, I think was probably their best work and just a pleasure to drive. Thanks for watching. All right, one other thing, I'm gonna floor it. Wow, that's 50 miles an hour. <laughs> Without even trying. And I was modulating the throttle so that I didn't get a bunch of wheel spin. This car has a lot of power. And, you know, is it faster than a Toyota Camry? You know, today's Toyota Camry with a V6? Probably not. But it's in the seven second range, zero to 60 for sure, which for a big family hauler, it's tough to beat with tons of torque. So just thought I would share that moment with everybody. Have a good day. Well, here I am on a rainy day on my way to retrieve new ride in the wonderful country of Canada. Stay tuned for what it is. It'll be a few hours. Yet I'm driving past Toronto, but it's worth it. Well, almost there. Just east of Toronto. We'll take a look once I load everything up. Well, I'll load it up. Something lies beneath. Stop importing the vehicle. Do you like learning the nitty gritty about classic vehicles? Then subscribe. 80% of you are not already. What are you waiting for? Get to learn more fun facts about American classics. Take care.